We're back again here at Prophet Central with chapter two of the book of Isaiah. We are going through some of the plain and simple teachings and prophecies that the Lord gave his prophet Isaiah, and we're likening them to ourselves today because we know that prophecy is for not just the people back then, but for us today, because they are significant. These words are meant to have dual fulfillment, or even more than just dual, but much more. These words are very significant. They are meant for the Lord's people. They are not just for the Jews, but they are for all of us Gentiles as well. So let's dig in. Let's do the word summary. I like to start off with this just to give us an idea of this overall tone. So 567 words in chapter two. Again, the first verse is the only one that's neutral because it's kind of an introduction. You have positivity being only about 28% of the words in this chapter. And 70% is negative. That's a little bit less than chapter one, but by and large, the overall tone of this chapter, too, is negative, just like chapter 1. So Isaiah is starting out here with a negative tone. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 will be our starting point. So I've highlighted the words yellow for neutral, blue for positive, and red for negative. This time in chapter 2, he starts off positive, and this is very significant for Latter-day Saints, and they like to interpret these words as speaking about Utah and the mountains there and the temples that they build and things like that. But I think there is much greater significance that the prophecy is fulfilled in very different ways than we have been taught or led to believe. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem and it came to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. My commentary on this is that the kingdom of God will be the greatest kingdom on earth as the most desirable for anybody who seeks peace and refuge and to learn the truth of Christ. Not just the truth of science and of the world, but of Christ. Because the truth of science never solves the greed of the world or the aspiration of the world to have power and influence, and it never solves war. Now also, God will cause much of the world to change as people flock to his kingdom, the greatest kingdom of all, giving up all of their unholy ways and ungodliness. People will learn to love each other as Christ's disciples, right? They will love God and love each other and walk in the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other way to develop this love than to love God and walk in his light. Verses six through nine. Therefore, thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. 
and the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them not. Now, I would say here that God is mentioning he forsakes the members of the church who continue in the iniquitous traditions of their fathers, being rich and powerful as well as idolatrous and being covenanted with their fellow man, they partake in selfish pleasures. Because they focus so much on ritualistic works, these religious ordinances that they do in temples, which are built by their own hands and their own fingers, they are not forgiven, nor are they covenanted with God, with their maker. Verses 10 through 22. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up and upon all the oaks of Bashan and upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up and upon every high tower and upon every fenced wall and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth in that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? That ends the chapter. I will give my last commentary here on this this bulk of verses at the end and and simplify it right there are a lot of words here that can kind of distract and we can dig into but i'll just try to keep it simple isaiah here is saying that many will run from the light of the gospel truth and they will hide in their shame when they can no longer hold on to their traditions and idolatry that god will take away he will not allow Nothing can stand as a replacement for the Lord of hosts. And all, even the greatest places and the greatest people will be brought down and put into a humble and lowly circumstance or they should be destroyed. Especially considering the religious places that claim to be godly or of a divine or supreme nature. Those are the, the places that God absolutely cannot allow to remain if he is to purify and to sanctify that is why he says upon his house the cleansing will begin and from there it will go out referencing doctrine and covenants 112 this is the last part last statement we must cease from trusting in man as many prophets have said trusting in the arm of flesh and in our own religious works to administer and provide salvation and covenant blessings. That is just the beginning to teach us, but to actually receive them, it takes works of the spirit, to worship in spirit and in truth, Christ says, not just in flesh and in works. The spirit that men claim to have is not the spirit of God, but is their own spirit that does not unify them with the Lord through faith. As he prays that we may be one with God as the Father and the Son are one. So that does it for chapter 2. I hope you can take these simple commentaries and dig in a little deeper. And as I said, if you have more to add or anything to correct or whatever you have to say, I'd love to hear it in the comments below or you can send me an email, whatever you want to do. Add to the conversation here. Let's learn from each other. Let's discuss the welfare of our souls. Because as Isaiah is stating here, that 
the Lord's people are on the edge of a cliff. You know, it's going to be quite a ride for the religious people of the world who draw nigh to God, but are indeed far from him. I'll see you in the next chapter soon enough, next week.